Um, my name is Michael Reynolds. I am the editor-in-chief of Europa Editions. Thanks very much for joining us. Um, this is a, a very special event for me. Um, I'm tremendously happy that you're all here and listening to this event. And I'm, I'm also really pleased to be partnering with our um, host stores this evening. Um, Book Passage, Bookshop Santa Cruz, Diesel Bookstore and Green Apple Books and Skylight Books in Los Angeles. Um, I think it's, you know, the, the independent bookstores in this country are, are our, our first and best friends um, as an independent press. I think it's no exaggeration to say that uh, many independent, independent presses like Europa Editions would not exist uh, um, without independent bookstores. And it would be all that harder to bring voices like that of Mieko Kawakami to, to readers here in America. Um, so thank you to all of the, the wonderful independent bookstores that have partnered on this event um, and uh, who are so supportive of uh, Mieko's work and, and Ruth's work as well. Um, and just speaking briefly of that passage, um, that journey into English and uh, to readers here in America, I would like to acknowledge uh, Mieko's two translators, David Boyd and, and Sam Bett, who um, are, are not on the panel this evening, on the part of the conversation this evening, but are, are very much part of the event in spirit. Um, as some of you in the audience will know, Mieko's novel Heaven, uh, which we published last year, is coming out, um, published last year is coming out in, in, in paperback in, in a couple of months. Uh, is currently shortlisted for the International Booker Prize, uh, a prize that recognizes not only the originality and the, and, and the beauty and the importance of the story told and the style in which it's told, but also the quality of its translation into English. Um, Sam and, and David are, are among the most talented translators that I have ever worked with and, and, and their translation of Mieko's work into English is, um, is really nothing short of miraculous. Um, tonight, Mieko is in conversation with, with Ruth Odzeki. Um, it, it really is a special delight for me that Ruth agreed um, very generously to be here with us uh, in conversation with Mieko because she is one of my most favorite contemporary writers, one um, whose sense of the extraordinary um, within the ordinary is, is really second to none and, and in whom I, I find such intelligence and, and, and generosity of spirit. Um, Ruth Odzeki is a novelist and a filmmaker uh, and a Zen Buddhist uh, priest, sorry, Zen Buddhist priest, and her, her most recent novel, um, which Ruth, you, you spotted immediately, is right behind me over here, and I swear I didn't put it here for this event, it's always there, um, it is uh, the book of form and emptiness, um, a wonderful, wonderful novel. She is also the author of My Year of Meats um, and, of course, uh, A Tale for the Time Being, which was the winner of the um, Los Angeles Times Book Prize and a finalist for the uh, for also for the Booker Prize. Um, so thank you, Ruth, for joining us. Uh, I, I, I'm going to assume that many of you at this event um, have read something by Mieko Kawakami and so will know already what a thrilling um, and unique voice she has. Uh, Mieko is the author of the internationally best-selling novel Breasts and Eggs, which was a New York Times notable book of the year and um, one of Time magazine's best 10 books of 2020. She is also the, the author of the highly acclaimed uh, Heaven, um, which Oprah Daly described as written with uh, jagged, visceral beauty. And Mieko's new novel um, is 
uh, All the Lovers in the Night, which publishes tomorrow um, and was described uh, recently uh, on Over the Weekend by Jo Hamya in her New York Times review as compact and subtle, a strikingly intelligent feat. Um, born in Osaka, Japan, winner of the Akatogawa Prize, the Tanizaki Prize, and the Murasaki Prize. Uh, Mieko now lives in Tokyo, Japan. Um, and I would also just like to add um, quickly, while I have this opportunity to Mieko, um, how extremely grateful that we are at Europa Editions um, to you for having given us the opportunity to uh, to be your American publisher. It's been a, a source of uh, constant delight and, and surprise and, and stimulation. It's been uh, an extraordinary experience. So thank you for that. Before um, I leave you briefly, <laughs> um, I, I also want to say hello again and thanks to Mary Joyce, um, who is interpreting um, for Mieko tonight and who has routine, routinely and, and consistently done just such an extraordinary job of interpreting for Mieko and we're immensely grateful. With that, um, I turn it over to you, Ruth and Mieko, and, and thank you again. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Michael. And Mieko, this is such a thrill for me to talk to you and to see you again after so many years. あの、前回お会いしたのが8年ぐらい前になりますね。あの、東京のあの大きな文学祭が開催されてその時に一緒にあのマームとジプシーという一人芝居あの劇団の一緒に感激していただいてその後にトークをしました。懐かしいです。今
And um, so one day after uh, Fuyuko drops off a manuscript at the publishing house, she happens to catch sight of her reflection in a shop window. And this is kind of a turning point because she's just sort of shocked to see um, this miserable drab woman standing there. And this seems to spark some kind of desire in her to change. And um, so the book really follows her uh, attempts at transformation, which are often painful and often very funny too. Um, and little by little, she changes from a, a kind of invisible, silent woman who proofreads other people's words to a, you know, an embodied woman with a voice of her own. And so I, Mieko, I just love this book and I loved it for so many reasons. So I'd like to start by just asking you, you know, people always ask novelists, you know, where did the idea for your book come from? And in my experience, the idea for a novel is never just one thing. It's usually a bunch of things kind of coming together and bumping into each other. And somehow from all this collision, you know, the novel and the characters are born. So I'm just curious about what kinds of things came together for you that inspired this book. Thank you so much. And thanks for what a wonderful synopsis as well. I was just so drawn into your words as you were sharing them. <laughs> you, wrote, you wrote the book. <laughs> いや、いや。それであの、私もあの、関さんと同じように、やっぱり物語があの、出てくるっていう時は、こう何かモヤモヤとしたものが複数のものがこう集まって、で、こう一つにこうなっていくっていうのは基本的にやっぱり私も同じ
That's really beautiful. Um, I'm, I've also been so interested um, in, you know, philosophical questions. What is real? You know, this this was kind of the um, the question that ran through my last book, um, and and the book before that, I was I was very interested in playing with um, physics, with quantum quantum mechanics, and um, and so I, I feel like there's a um, you know the, uh, that there's a that our books are kind of talking to each other in that regard. Um, and one of the things that um, I was I really enjoyed in this is the way that you um, that that you discussed or and it, it's not you know it, it's the um, it's Fuyuko and her um, her her uh, friend Mitsuka right um, the way they discuss light and sort of break it down and it's it's very beautiful and it has the um, effect of almost re-enchanting the world. この抑圧、っていうin the process of writing this novel, I went to a large company that does proofreading and actually interviewed and spoke with a lot of proofreaders. Of course, part of that was to learn about you know, the practical process of the work that they do, but more than that, about how they work together with the words as well, how they read or do not read the works that they are uh, working with in that sense as well, what happens within that process. And one thing that uh, all of them said is, first of all, proof, proofreaders really have to suppress themselves in, in that process of reading a work. They cannot allow themselves to actually read the story which is taking place in the pages there as well. And the other thing which all of them said is no matter how many proofreaders will look at a particular work, there will always be a mistake that can be found in there. There is no work that exists without any kind of typing mistake or something in there as well. And I think that this is something which really resonates with our human existence as well. It's only that moment that we discover these mistakes that they actually start to exist in a way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's that's wonderful. I love that. Um, you know, uh, Fuyuko is such an interesting and appealing character. I, I just really loved her. And um, when I, you know, when I learned early in the book that she was a proofreader, right, I had two thoughts, right? And my first thought was, Damn, I wish I'd thought to write a novel about a proofreader. <laughs> and then the second thought was, damn, I wish I had a proofreader like Fuyuko, you know? <laughs> she's just she's just wonderful. And so I guess my question is, um, what is it that drew you to um, writing about a proofreader? Where did that idea come from? What what um what was the kind of um yeah, I mean it, it's such a brilliant idea and um and I sort of felt that right away. It, you know, the proofreader is kind of an invisible profession that most people never think about. And so, you know, she she's kind of hiding, sort of in the in the you know in the wings or in the shadows. So I'm just I'm curious where that idea came from and and how was that to write? <laughs> あの、存在に、こう身近に感じることってまずなかったと思うんですね。だから私がやっぱり小説を書いて<笑> 
また書き手がもう自分の作品をこう何回も念入りに読んでいくってことは多分違うような直感があったんですよね。うん、ねそ,うそれでそこにすごくまず興味があったのとやっぱりその私が取材をした高越者の方が間違いは必ずあるんだけれどそれを見つけるまでは存在しないって言ったことがもう頭から離れなくてそれって本当にそのまま私たちにとっての死。死,死,も死,で死,の死との距離というか本当に私たちをいつか必ず捉えてしまう死っていうのはあるんだけれどでもその時がいつ来るかわからないで,でも死んだ死んだ時っていうのは私たちとそらく認識できなくてでそういうなんか誤植っていうものがいろんなものを表現できると思ったんですね。Profession, I wouldn't really have even known about the existence of proofwriters or people doing this work as well. But as a writer, you know, having these mistakes and things found in my own work when it was being proofed by them was you know, the first encounter there. But from, from then as well, of course, as a writer, proofreaders are people who we cannot see their faces, but we're connected to them in such an important way as well. And so, as to why I decided to, to focus on a proofreader as the main character, I really had this interest in. The different sense of the process of reading, whether it's being read by a proofreader, being read by the reader of the novel who's enjoying, enjoying it as they're reading it, and then, of course, as an author reading their own work as well, these different processes and sense in that as well. That was where my first interest there as、uh, was. But then, within my interviews with proof, proofreaders、uh, in preparation, the fact that all of them said that there is always a mistake in everything, but it doesn't exist until it is discovered. That really stuck in my mind. I couldn't get those words out of my head in a way. And it really seems to me that it's the same distance as experienced between death and, and us as we are living as well. You know, in a sense, of course, death will come to us all one day, but until that moment, you know, it has this, this distance from us as well. But then the moment that we die, of course, perhaps we're no longer able to, to recognize or, or acknowledge to understand that in a sense as well. And so I feel that mistakes in that sense can really be related to, to many different things in our experience. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Oh, that's really beautiful. I love that. I love that.、Um, you know, and it, it's interesting too because I think,、um, you know, to kind of put those two answers together a little bit,、um, I get the feeling, you know, reading Fuyuko,、um, you know, she's the first person narrator. So she's narrating the whole book. And,、um, and she has this. She has this beautiful language, right, that, that she uses to narrate the book. But when she actually tries to,、um, you know, interact with people, with other, other people in her life,、um, she has a very hard time finding what language, finding words. And so it's almost as if Fuyuko is kind of, up until a point anyway, it's almost as if she's, you know, if, if life is a book. Right? <laughs> If life is a book, then she's standing to one side of the book and she's kind of suppressing her story until she starts to tell it in, in this book. Right? Yeah, so, in the first place, 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 the うん、私たちがこんなに今たくさんのまあ色に囲まれてるんですけどもこれはまあその光のレベルで見ると全てが残り物の残り物を見ているっていう物理学上はなるみたいなんですね。うん Uh, thank you so much for that. I think it's the same for, for words, but also life and death. And also, if we come to light and the very existence of light as well, the more you research about that, the more you really feel that it's a very strange and peculiar thing indeed. And I mean, the different colors, of course, we're all surrounded by many colors, but these colors are just things which are you know, left behind by, by the light. <laughs> 小説家はおそらく言葉で世界を認識してあの何とかこう書きあのな、まあ、なんていうのかな物語にしていこうとする人たちなんですけど物理とかあるいはその尾関さんの,その禅っていう考え方その姿勢とかから見た時に世界の在り方っていうのはやっぱりそれぞれのこう何ていうのかなであのレイヤーがある。でそ,それをやそれはす素晴らしいことですごいことでやっぱり人生が1回ではちょっと足りないなという気持ちになりますね。<笑> 
of course, as an author, you know, we perhaps, you know, recognize or look at the world through words, and then we express that, of course, in words mm. as well. But when we look at whether it's physics or, you know, Ruth yourself, you know, looking at Zen and its way of thinking and so on as well. All of this has so many layers included within there, which is such a wonderful thing. And when we think about that, you know, just having one life is, is really not enough. <laughs> definitely <laughs> not. <laughs> it's definitely not. There are too many books to write, Viego san. There's too many books to write. もう、あと長編 and it's perhaps limited in terms of, you know, how many more full length works we can write in a lifetime, of course, as well. But we can thinking about the fact that where we're living in life itself is, you know, part of something bigger, something greater in a way. But there are so many things that we do not have the power to change as well there. It's really just completely full of contradictions in that way. Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, I wanted to just talk a little bit more about Fuyuko because I, I was so... Um, I, I just loved her language so much. Um, she has, you know, what you manage to convey or evoke in her character is her remarkable powers of observation. You know, she has such a keen eye and she pays, you know, of course, because she's a proofreader, but she pays this meticulous attention to detail, right? And this is what makes her so good at her job. But it's also when she turns that eye like on herself, right, it makes her sort of painfully self-conscious, right? And so the, you know, the same eye that looks out and sees, you know, sees beauty, sees all the mistakes in herself, right? And that, that, was, that was really kind of heartbreaking. That really was very moving, um, you know, and, and part of what I felt characterized her. 彼女はあの、やはり内気なね、そのちょっとこう、あの、私の書いた登場人物の中で彼女は一番、まあ、地味なキャラクターなんですけれども、一番この本がよく読まれていて、冬子さんに、あの、冬子さん、冬子さんって言ってくれる読者が多いんです。so she is indeed, you know, quite an in internal looking, not necessarily such a social personality. And uh, Mitsutsuka, who she develops this relationship as well, is also similar in that sense. And I really wanted to write and portray the relation that develops between the two of them. Uh, but it's quite surprising, but actually it's more than 10 years since I actually wrote uh, this novel. And it's, it's interesting because within the different characters that I have written, she's perhaps the most plain in a sense, but this book is perhaps one of the most widely read uh, works that I have written. And everybody is always, you know, talking about this character, Fuyuko, Fuyuko, everybody really uh, comes back to her. And when I wrote this book, it was at a time in Japan where um, the issues related to sort of irregular work or precarious work, in a sense, were starting to come up. で、今、10年経ってどう変化したかというと、事態はもっともっとひどくなっていて、あの、フリーランス、あの、非正規雇用者の方々はその、私もちろんフリーランスの人たちみんなこのコロナ禍になってもすごい打撃を受けて、本当
で今またそのミート運動とかフェミニズムがこうすごく日本でも盛り上がってきてみんなでこう周知されるようになってきていろんな世代の人若い人たちも出てきてあの共有される大きな喜,喜ばしい変化もあったんですが当時はやっぱりなんだろうあのまだお女の人ってを評価するときにあの子供を産んだ母親になったかキャリアを持っている人かってすごくあの図式があのの中で評価されることが普通だったんですね。At the time I wrote this book, it was 2010, and in the period since then, we've had,、um, of course, looking at the feminist movement or also Me Too, which has become you know much more perhaps well known here in Japan, more particularly young people also engaged in this. And there are some very positive changes that we have seen in, in this period throughout that as well. But at the time when I wrote this, this was still very strongly that within society, the way that women would be evaluated is you know, whether they have children, whether they are a mother, have a career, these very set kind of indices in a way which were used to, to judge women in society.、Mm-hmm. <laughs> あのそんなに書かれたことのないキャラクターを作り上げたいってすごく思ったんですね。その非正規雇用で将来がなくてあの分かりやすいその昭和の時代が持てたあの将来を持てなくてそれであのパートナーシップも持てないそれであのもう本当にそそのそ今メインのキャラ今すごく人々にとってメインな。なんていうのかなあり方になってしまってるんですけどでもそ,うその人たちで三塚さんもあの実はなんだろうこれはあれだけどまあ似たような状況の人であ,あるとでそれでその2人がじゃあなんていうのかなど,どこに人生の性の喜びとか、うんうん、いいそうし幸せというのはな何なのかと。いうことみたいなものまで届けばいいなというふうに思って書いたことすごく思い出します。So at the time, I was you know, reading various novels, talking to various people, and so on. And I really wanted to write a character that hadn't appeared in, in other work until then. You know, so looking at someone who is in this irregular employment without necessarily a clearly defined future, but based on you know, that legacy of that Showa period in Japan of this high growth and so on as well. But someone who also doesn't have any kind of you know, partnerships in terms of relationship, which this is perhaps now a sort of quite Uh, main or common way of, of being for people in society as well. But in a way, also Mitsutsuka, the other character as well, without giving too much away, is in similar circumstances in his life as well. So I was really thinking about when writing these two, you know, where do you find, where do people like them, can they find joy in life? You know, what is happiness?、Mm-hmm. These are the kinds of questions that I really want to deliver, to deliver as I was writing this. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah, that's so interesting. I, there's so many. Areas that so many directions I want to go in now. But、um, just to go back to this idea of the freelance status,、um, I think that in,、um, in the US,、um, the, you know, the sort of employment systems are different. And、um, so, you know, th- when Fuyuko leaves this company, You know, that, that she's working in. She has a real, you know, she has a company job. She's, you know, working as a proofreader in this company. And、um, it's very oppressive because she's being bullied in this company.、Um, the other, particularly the other women, are being quite cruel to her.、Um, and she finally, you know, decides to leave and to go freelance. And there's this beautiful passage、um, where she, when she walks out of the, Office and、um, and she experiences, you know, she just experiences the world in this kind of wide open, you know, again, this kind of re enchantment, you know.、Um, and and I'll just read that passage if it's okay with you, because I'd like to, you know, I'd like people to, you know, sort of hear what kind of, you know, what we're talking about. Is that okay? Because it's so beautiful. So she, she writes, she, you know, she's carrying these two paper bags out, and she says, Setting my two paper bags onto the ground, I took a moment to stretch my back and exhaled deeply, and then inhaled so deeply that my chest hurt. 
Once I repeated this a few times, a freshness I was sure I'd never known before spread slowly through my lungs, and I was filled with an awareness of the soft places inside me, spreading outward by degrees. It felt as if the flow of cars, no different than ever, and the greenness of the streetside vegetation and the air itself were all a little bit more lucid than usual. Right. And it's this, it's this beautiful evocation of somebody who walks out of the office and just experiences the world, you know? And it's so sad because then the next minute she starts to doubt her decision. And suddenly, and she writes, the veil of darkness came down over all I saw. And, and that little section, I thought, just, I mean, there's, I could, I feel like I could just, I would just want to read out loud sections because they're all so beautiful. But that the contrast there between that, that expansion and the light and then the veil of darkness coming down was, was really interesting to me and very beautiful. And, and so I think that, um, you know, for, for uh, Americans to really understand, you know, the, the stakes involved um, of quitting your job at a company and going out into the world as a freelancer, um, you know, it's a big deal, right? For people in the United States, would quitting a sort of company job be such a big deal in that sense? You know, I think it's different. I think that um, people in, in America jump around a lot. I think we have, you know, we don't have that tradition of, you know, of graduating from college and being employed at one company and staying there, you know, the lifetime employment system, which was, you know, such a big deal in Japan for so many decades, right? And after the war. And then, you know, recently it's really started to fall apart. And we never had that system, you know? そうか。あ、そうか。あの、会社を完全にこう、こう、ダンスするんじゃなくて、so it's perhaps in the United States, there's more the situation of, you know, people change between different companies and have sort of step ups or stages in their career through this. But in Japan, it's, it's really always been how much you can stay in, in the one single company, even if it's, you know, struggling through things there and contribute to that specific company has kind of always been, been the way that that's evaluated. <laughs> And it's quite a difficult uh, situation in the sense as well. And the generation that I'm from is I'm really right in the middle of that generation where, where that shifted in a way as well. いわゆる日本の教育のトラックに乗るような家庭ではなくて、もうストリート出身で、中学時代から14歳から働いているので、どこかのカンパニーに属するとか、そういったことは自分の人生の選択肢にはまずなかったんだけれど。For me personally, I didn't grow up on that, you know, track of you know, education and company and so on. I, I really grew up on the street. I was working since I was 14 years old. And so for me, that, that idea of, you know, joining a company and working in that company was, was never really there. それでもあの私たちが社会に出る私たちの世代が社会に出るって時にフリーランスっていうこれからフリーランスっていうのが出てフリーランスとして生きていくっていう選択肢ができますよっていうのが歌われた時だったんですよその but for our generation, um, when we sort of, you know, grew up and went out into society, you could say mm -hmm. this was a time when really having the choice of being able to live as, you know, in freelance work was presented as a very positive way for the first time, actually, with these kind of neoliberal ideas that were coming in in regards to employment. その時々にやりたいことをその時々の能力に合わせて自分の人生をクリエイトしていこうこれからは主体性はこっちにあるんだっていうような雰囲気でネオリベって始まったのをすごく覚えてるんです。
And so it had been until then, there was really this, you know, single form that you would join a company and stay there for 30 years and work there. But I, I can really remember when it was starting to be introduced and, you know, saying you can have a different way. You can you can work as you like in a way that matches the skills that you have at that particular time, create your own life and you can be the one taking the agency in your life. And this introduction of these kind of neoliberal ideas in a way. Yeah. わけなんですよね編成と終わってそしたら今日本どうなってるかというともう本当に見るも無残なというか私たちの世代はもう何て言うのもう所得がどんどん下がってけ結婚ももう物理的に結婚とか家庭を新しく持つことが自分のユニットを持つことがまずもう難しいで家賃を払い続けていくことももう難しくなってもう新自由主義ってのの悪いいところというか夢,夢がもう一気に、うん、あれは何だったんだということでこの30年が終わってしまったんですね。But as to what's happened in Japan in the 20, 30 years since then, with you know, the end of the Heisei era and so on, now it's in this very cruel situation where, with, for our generation, there is this huge income disparity which is in place. It's extremely difficult for people to be able to even financially you know, have their own family or family unit to continue to pay rent as well. And really, we're seeing now these negative sides of this you know, neoliberal dream that was being presented. I mean,、mm. Where did that go? What, what has happened now? And the situation 30 years later is completely different. だから冬子もその世代ですね少し私より年下なんですけど冬子もその世代で,あのでもでもその中でもやっぱり私たちは生き,る生きるためにあるいは生きていることから幸せとか希望とかそういったものをあの見つけるものだしあの見つけてほしいし見つけたいと思っていますでそれが一体何なのかこれまで幸せだって言われていた例えば家族を持つこととか親になることとか出世することとかそういったルールではない何かもっとこうこすごくパーソナルなもの、うん、なんか記憶とかねなんか思い出とかもちろん思い出とか記憶でお腹はねあのご飯は食べていけないんですけどでも人間は精神でもあるからやっぱりそこはもう絶対に譲りたくないというか,、うん、なんかすごくその中ものすごい辛い中ですごく極限状態、まあ、日本というのはまだ恵まれてますけどもうそんなすごくハードなシチュエーションの中で美とかね光のあり方とか,なんか圧倒的な何て言うんだろう,こう自分とかそう個人を超えたものにこう見る瞬間とかっていうのが私の個人的な体験で言うと子どもの頃から。もうダメだと思う時にもやっぱりなんか美とか私的な瞬間みたいなものっていうのは確かに何かであってくれたんですよ。And so Fuyuko is part of that very generation. She's you know, a few years younger than me, but you know, really in this, within these very you know, cruel and difficult situations, we need to see you know, as you are living within your life, how you can find happiness and how you can find hope as well. And this is something that I, of course, you know, hope that everybody will be able to do. And I want to be able to do the same for myself as well. But these things that were always thought of as you know, the way to define happiness, you know, having a family, becoming a parent, succeeding in your career. How we can find different forms of happiness as we are living as well in a much more personal way. This can perhaps be in you know, memory. Of course, you cannot you know, survive and make a living just based on memory as well. But humans are also you know, spirits, and I don't want to, or we shouldn't have to abandon that side of ourselves as well. So, even in very difficult, extreme situations, I think that it's always, poss it's always possible to find that. Moment of beauty, that light, that overwhelming moment when you can always almost transcend yourself in a way as well. And even since I was a child, even times which were extremely difficult, there's always been that, that one moment of beauty that you can find.、Mm. I think this is what Fuyuko does so beautifully in this book.、Um, you know, in a way, you know, it is a first person narrative, right? And first person narratives are always narratives of survival. Right. The, the, I, you know, a first person narrator, narrator is, you know, that, that story is always, you know, sort of, dear reader, 
you know, I survive to tell the tale. And, and that's what that's what Fuyuko does. She survives to tell the story, the story of her life. And, you know, and she finds the words. And so I think it's a, you know, it's a it's such a beautiful um, and, and very hopeful, you know, very hopeful book. So I thought I thought that was just lovely. Um, and I think Michael is back so that um, because I and I think we have questions. Is that right, Michael? From it's been such a wonderful conversation. Thank you to you both. But <laughs> I, I, I have also so many more questions. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I don't want to leave our audience members no, hanging no, no. and there are a few good questions. Good, but good. Um, I'll start with with Alison. Now, you, you, you touched upon this earlier with regard to the changing context around your novel, Mieko, but I think Alison's question is a little bit different. It's more about sort of the personal experience, the experience of you as a writer coming back to a book that you wrote more than a decade ago uh, and is just now coming out in translation in English. W what is that experience like for you? なんかやっぱりだんだんこの年なんか一年が一年とか五年とかその時間の経過がやっぱりねどんどん短く感じられているので十年前っていうもののに対する若い時は十年ですごい。それこそ、ね、永遠みたいに感じてたけど、最近はもう10年って言うと、うん、昔の3年ぐらいの感覚。So of course as as time passes, whether it's you know one year or five years, I think the way that you feel time passing as you grow older becomes it, it's much shorter in a sense as well. You know, when when you're younger, 10 years feels like an eternity. But for me now, you know, 10 years ago, it feels like it was maybe just about three years ago. And hearing Ruth's words today, I think I, I could really see within this novel there was also this theme of survival in a sense. And finding or mistakes in a book are also can be seen as a way of survival, perhaps. And color remains in our, you know, visible to us as well, in is a sense of survival there as well. で、この本自体もあの10年前に日本語で書かれたあの本だったんですけどもまたある意味でそのいろんな言語に変わることによって新しい読者を得て場所を置いてこのまた独自のなんていうのかなうんあのあり方を似出会えたっていうふうに思って and I think this book itself, while it was written 10 years ago in Japanese, and uh, now it's in a sense, you know, by being transformed into a different language, it's reaching new readers, new places, it's having its own mm. sort of new way of ex existing in that sense. Mm. Mm. It's changing forms mm. and surviving in mm. this way. Mm. That's how I feel about this now. Katrina mm. asks, um, you often write about social outcasts. Uh, is there a reason that you are drawn to characters who live outside society? For me, it's quite a simple motivation for that, but I think that the majority of people really are outcasts or marginalized in a way. So I, I don't want to write works that, you know, take someone who, who's already happy, who's already living in a luxurious way and amplifies that and makes that better. I want to take people who are living in sad or very difficult circumstances and somehow reduce or halve those difficulties for them. And I think that living is something which is cruel, it is painful, it is sad, and really that can be said for life itself. So I think that living is something which is cruel, it is painful, it is sad, and really that can be said for life itself. 
もしかしたらひょっとしたら意識もなくて、人を書くと必ずそうなってしまう。So for me, perhaps it's not even a conscious thing of writing about people who are marginalized in a way, but when writing itself, it, it automatically turns to those kinds of people.、Mm-hmm. Thank you. Can, can I squeeze in a question of my own for both of you, actually, because you, you touched upon、um, the, the question of enchantment. You spoke about enchantment during your conversation. And, and I just you know, I think it's an important capacity for writers, obviously, for readers as well. but Um, also, for non readers, it's something that we all need, I think, that capacity. And I, I, I wonder if you have any tricks on how we cultivate the capacity for enchantment, how we protect it, maybe. I mean, for me, a contemplative practice,、uh, you know, meditation and, and、um, you know, just、uh, having a, a, a contemplative practice. I sit, I sit zazen, you know, every day. And zazen is, a, I feel that it, it's, a, you know, a doorway to enchantment. You know, it just enables you to slow down and, and open up your senses, you know. I mean, so much of what I love about Mieko's writing is the, the sensual detail in it. You know, this ability of the characters to, you know, to see things and to feel things. And, and very often the senses are, you know, sort of crossing. So, you know, a sound will be soft, right? You know,、um, uh, in, I remember in Heaven,、um, you talked about the character's voice being like a 6B pencil, right? Sounding like a 6B pencil, like a soft, you know, soft lead. And, and that kind of sensory crossing, right, is, I, I feel that's enchanting, you know. So when I, when, you know, to, to just kind of open your senses and, and to be aware and slow down and really kind of take in the world,、um, that, that language, I think, comes. And that, that is a kind of re enchantment. Yeah.、Mm-hmm. 私もあの書くときに一番最初にこの対話の一番最初にいろんなものが立ち上がってきてそれが混ざり合って物語を成していくっていう中にやっぱりその私は詩も書きますので詩を書くと書くときにあるいは小説もそうなんですけどやっぱりこうなんかこう美というかビュ,ビューティーですね、美しさみたいなものっていうのにすごく、なんだろうな、いつも驚いてるんですね、驚いてるんです。あの夕焼けがあんな感じだっていうことにも驚いているし、あのいちっちゃな石のシェイプにも驚くしで、で、それが全部消えてしまう、今を生きてる、か今はすか必ず失われてしまう。失われの中にあるっていうことをいつも本当に驚いているしでそのこの驚きがやっぱり、うん、私が創作をしている理由で、うん、だと思い,思いますね。うん For me, also, as we discussed at the beginning of today's dialogue as well, you know, when you're writing a story, it's this process of many things all, all coming together in a way. And as well as novels, I also write poetry, but within this, particularly looking at you know, beauty, and beauty is something which I think you can always find, I always find it very astonishing in a way, you know, that a sunset can look like it is, or the shape of a small stone that you might happen to pick up, but also the fact that. All of these things might, you know, they're, they're all going to disappear one day, and that you're living in this moment where perhaps they have already disappeared as well. And this will be the same, of course, for life itself as well. This is something that I always find surprising and astonishing, I think. And this, this surprise is really the reason that I create, that I write. In your work, Mieko, at least in the English translation of the book, there is a tendency to, to describe. Uh, traumas and psychological issues in clear terms, but without naming them,、um, depression as an example.、Um, can you speak to your choice、uh, to allied labeling these psychological states?、うんまだあのアメリカでは発表されてないんですけど、この間短編集、ショートストーリー、うん、ストートストーリー出しまして、それもやっぱり COVID-19 という言葉は使わずに感染症という言葉をに統一したんですね
So in a work that I recently published of short stories, uh, which is not out or available in the United States yet, but I, I wrote about the situation, but instead of directly referring to COVID-19, I wrote about an infectious disease or a contagious disease.の、ま、対局にあるものをディテールを積み上げていく。その、そのうん。and so all, all of the short stories in, in that book are related to COVID-19, but I, I really deliberately don't want to categorize or, or label in that sense as well. I want to look at perhaps what's, what's on the other side of that as well. The, the individual person, the individual situation or circumstances is, is always what I, I try to portray in my writing there as well. And... Um, you know, perhaps it's it's the same for within within the work as well, but the same also for you know genre. I don't not want to start from a particular genre and which is defined and then write a work from there, or even for gender and age. It's not from the circumstances that I want to approach something, but always from the individuality within. Um, there are so many great questions that have come in now, which I, I think is a reflection of what a great conversation this was. Um, I think. Maybe I have time for two last questions. Um, so I'll get to Brianna's question. I'll try to roll two of hers into one if I can. Um, both of you, Ruth and Mieko, uh, you, you talked briefly about uh, women's literature from Japan um, having a, a moment. Um, are there particular themes, specific themes that are emerging from this literature um, and that are expressed in, in your respective works. Um, and uh, for, for you, Miyako, I, I, the, the additional question, are, are, you other, are you sometimes surprised by the reaction that your work um, receives when it's translated and published overseas? Well, I'll just um, jump in quickly. Um, you know, I think that my work is is um, not women's literature from Japan. It's women's literature from um, America, but it's about Japan, right? Or at least some of it is about Japan. So it has kind of Japanese themes. So it's a, it's a little bit different, but I do see um, I, I do see uh, similarities or or places where um, Mieko-san's work and my work kind of um, join. And certainly, um, you know, the the focus on women is you know is extremely important. Um, the focus as well on bullying and power distribution is also very important. Um, the interest in physics and philosophy and this way that science you know can make the world you know, un explain the world, but also make it strange for us in a beautiful way. So that's, I think, something. Um, decisions that women have to make, like, you know, job decisions versus childbearing decisions, those kinds of things, I think is those are also um, similarities. Um, and then the last thing I would say is, a, is an awareness of the importance of story, right? So it's a kind of um, almost a metafictional awareness of the importance of telling story. So I, I think that those are just things that pop off the top of my head. And in that sense, you know, within Ruth's work as well, you know, portraying the life of a certain person, it really comes to these questions of, you know, what, what is expression even as well? Mm. 
日本のイメージイコールやっぱ東京東京のイメージだったんですよね。で東京っていうのはすごくあの非常に何て言うのかな奇妙な奇妙な融合をしている都市で,でみんな日本人は同じようなこう暮らしを水準の暮らしをしていてで同じぐらいハッピーで同じぐらい不幸。っていうイメージをみんなやっぱり取材とかたくさん受けても持っていらした。And as to the question which was directed to me, I think that until now, whether it's within the Japanese literature that was being translated or the image that most people have of Japan is, of course, Tokyo, which is a city which is a very peculiar fusion in a way as well. But through the interviews and so on that, that I've had with、um, you know, people outside of Japan, I, I found that most people have this image of all Japanese people living the same standard of living and the same, the same amount of happiness and the same amount of unhappiness as well. だからやっぱり日本はある種そのすごくあの文化的にも経済的にも,もうあの固定されていてそこから出てくる何かまあキッチュっていうかちょっとこうフリーこうなんていうのかなこうちょっとねあのこうウォーあなんていうのあれあのなんていうのかなこうちょっとフリークなものみたいなものを期待されてるっていうのはすごくあの感じていたんですあの私のエアあのエアコン進めてる時にも。And so, in a sense, I think that there is this sort of you know, fixed image of Japan, both culturally and economically, in a way as well. And, and I felt that you know, in the process of my works coming out in English and so on, there's always this expectation of what is coming out from Japan to be somewhat sort of kitsch and quirky in a way. すごいニコニコ親切なんだけど何を考えてるかわからない東京の人でもっと奇妙な話君たちの感じてるオタクとあるとかナルドの感じとかそういったものをもっと聞かせてって言われてるような気がずっとしてたんですね。So, I always feel that you know, people have this image of you know, the people in Tokyo, they're smiling, they're happy, but you don't know what they're thinking under that. And people are always saying, tell us what's under that, you know, more about this otaku or the nerds or this kind of culture as well. でも私は絶対にそのもうみんなが欧米の英米ですね、の外国語で読んでくれる読者が安心する、安心できるような物語をまず読んでほしいと思わなかったんです。But of course, I, I don't want the, the readers in the US or the UK and so on to be reading works that they can just you know, read and be put at ease in a way. And so I, I really didn't want to just write something which would fulfill these expectations that readers in the US would have of Japan, you know, the kind of Japan that they expect to see on the page as well. And you know, want to show, you know, classes, class differences do exist in Japan. People are living on the street. You know, women are living in these kind of situations as well. And this is really what I wanted to write about, even from my first work. ね、so, in terms of the, the reactions from international readers, and if there was anything that surprised me, one of the first reactions or most common reactions was, Oh, we didn't know there were poor people in Japan as well. <laughs> so, そうですね。Um, if you haven't already, you should run out and buy both Ruth's and Mieko's latest book,、um, books at those bookstores.、Um, a reminder that Ruth's most recent book is The Book of Form and Emptiness, and Mieko's latest novel publishes tomorrow, and it's called All the Lovers in the Night.、Um, this has been Really, an unforgettable conversation. I'm grateful to both of you、um, for your time and、uh, also to you, Mary, for making this possible, and、um, to everyone who joined us. Thank you very much and good night. 
尾崎さんありがとうございました。いいえ、大変楽しかった。こちらこそすごい楽しかったんです。またお会いできるの楽しみにしています。そうですね。そうですね。よろしくお願いします。<笑>気をつけてね。はい、ありがとうございます。ありがとうございます。Thank you for watching. Thank you very much.